Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining today's Accelerate webinar where we will hear two excellent speakers and they will present studies that deal with the safety, effectiveness, timing and the op optimal numbers of COVID-19 vaccinations. The two presentations will be approximately 20 minutes each and they'll be uh, 10 minutes after each of the sessions where you can ask questions. Um, and you can write your questions in the chat as we go along, and I'll make sure to read them to the speakers as they complete their presentations. Um, and so I will be the moderator today, and my name is uh, Nina Beinholt Stärke. I'm a doctor and researcher at Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark. Uh, and I've been part of planning and executing the enforced study that Joe will be telling us about shortly. Uh, but I actually also participated in the ACTT and TICO studies, as I would imagine a lot of you have. So uh, I'm really excited to hear the talks today. So um, let's get started. Uh, and our first speaker uh, is Dr. Joanne Rieke. Uh, she leads the Biostatistics and Epidemiology Group at the Center of Excellence for Health, Immunity and Inf Infections at Rieshospitalet in Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, she's an epidemiologist and a biostatistician, and she has more than 10 years of experience in infectious disease research. And in the past few years, she's spent a lot of time working on the study that she'll be presenting to us today, uh, the enforced study. So please, Joe, tell us some more about that. Thank you, Nina. Thanks for that nice introduction, and thanks for inviting me to be here. And um, I'm just going to share my slides. Um, to share the screen. There we go. Can you all see the slides? Thank you. Yep. So as Nina mentioned, um, I'm just going to present some of the, give an overview really of the enforced study and then present some of the initial findings um, from the study, which I've been working on as lead statistician for the past year since it started early last year. Take my slides to move. Oh, they're not moving. Try to move. Yeah. Hold on, let me just stop sharing and see if I can reshare them a different way. Try to share sharing this way. Does that work? Could I have my agenda too? Yes, sir. Can you see them now? Mm -hmm. Okay, and they're moving. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. So I thought I'd start by giving you a bit of a background as to why uh, we designed the study and came up with Enforce. So Denmark began their uh, mass SARS CoV-2 immunization program um, towards the end of December uh, 2020. And it, like a lot of different countries, it was initially uh, targeted at people in specific risk groups, the elderly and selected key workers workers in the health and social care settings. Um, and then it was expanded uh, to the general population with the uh, all British residents in Denmark having been offered the vaccine um, by the end of August uh, 2021. And vaccination in Denmark is free and voluntary. But at the time when the vaccines were originally being rolled out here, um, although um, phase two and phase three clinical trials had shown high vaccine efficacy, and there was very limited knowledge about the long term effectiveness of these vaccines and also the safety of, um, and durability, and particularly um, when in high risk individuals, as a lot of these individuals are typically not involved in clinical trials. Um, so that that was the decision as to why there was a need to study um, these vaccines over the long term and in particularly in these high risk ind individuals and elderly individuals. And just to give you a bit of background about the um, uh, uptake of the vaccines within Denmark and um, this graph here shows the percentage of individuals in Denmark who have received a third dose of the vaccine. I took this data from the SSI uh, website um, and it's up to date from the 30th of May and you can see that overall in Denmark vaccine uptake was very high and this shows that over 70% of those adults aged over um, 18 have received a third dose of the vaccine. So um, going back to enforce. So, as I mentioned, the primary objective um, for Enforce was to investigate the effectiveness and safety 
of the SARS-CoV vaccine that were utilized in the Danish uh, COVID-19 vaccine program. And as part of the objective, um, the aim was to compare and predict the durability of the minimum protective features um, by each of the vaccines against COVID-19. And this is done by conducting comprehensive SARS-CoV-2 antibody analysis and in-depth characterization of the vaccine-induced cellular immune response. And then there's also a number of secondary objectives um, as part of the study that can kind of be classed in two groups. One um, is looking at effectiveness and the other one looking at safety. So for effectiveness, we have um, another uh, evaluation of endpoints looking at the number of breakthrough infections. And these are evaluated both through uh, positive PCR tests and also through detailed immunological assessments. And then we also have a number of safety endpoints that we're looking at in the study, including looking at the local and systemic reactions um, that are reported following within the 14 days following each of the vaccine doses, and also the number and types of grade three and four adverse events and serious adverse events that are reported following the vaccine. Um, so the study design, um, it was designed as an open label, non-randomized parallel group phase four study. And it was a collaborative effort across seven different study sites, which cover all five regions um, in Denmark. Um, all adults who were offered a vaccination through the Danish COVID-19 vaccination program were eligible for inclusion in the study. But as we particularly wanted to target those high risk individuals and elderly individuals, um, we uh, implemented a couple of methods to kind of increase um, these groups in our um, enrollment. So we sent a letter of invitation um, to selected groups at increased risk of serious course of the disease, and also uh, healthcare workers who, um, as you're aware, were at increased risk of exposure, um, were um, informed about the study through hospital information channels. And then also members from the general population were invited through a letter sent uh, via the vaccine centres. And the initial aim of the study was to enroll um, 2,500 participants in four vaccine groups, and we plan to follow participants for two years. Um, and as part of the study design, we also agreed to send uh, regular monthly reports to the Danish Medicines Agency to give them updates on the current status of the study and also an overview of the specific objectives and a detailed um, list and summary of the safety outcomes that have been reported so far. And the study was approved by the Danish Medicines Agency. So this just um, gives you an overview of the visit schedule. Um, as I said, we were following participants for two years. And also, um, I've added here some of the details of the data that was collected. So the nice thing about the study is that the first enrollment visit was um, prior to vaccination. So we collected a specimen um, to analyze the antibody levels prior to individuals receiving um, any vaccination doses. And then the second visit was prior to individuals receiving their second vaccine dose. The third visit was scheduled for three months after the first vaccine dose. And then uh, subsequent visits were a six months visit four, 12 months visit five, and then uh, a visit at two years, um, which is visit six. And to give you some more details about the data that we've collected, so on the electronic case report forms, um, we've collected the information on participants' demographics and also their uh, self reported medical history and what medications they were receiving at enrollment. And then this is also the way that we collect any safety measures that are being reported um, following vaccination. So all serious adverse events, uh, the grade three and four um, adverse events that were reported within 30 days of the vaccine. And also um, we, we give participants a symptoms form so they can record local and systemic reactions um, first within the first seven days and then within the subsequent 14 day period after each vaccine. Um, in addition to this, as I said, um, we take blood samples at every study visit, um, and then these are evaluated using two different assays. So um, they're evaluated using the mesoscale diagnostic multi-antigen serology assay, and this gives us um, both the spike, the spike protein receptor binding domain, and the nucleocapsid antibody specific for SARS-CoV-2, and it also gives us the ACE2 competition. And then in addition to this, um, we have the Vanti assay, ELISA assay, um, which gives us the total serum IgG to the receptor binding domain. And this ELISA assay, we also get the results um, um, not just as a continuous variable, but also as a cutoff, so with positive, negative, and inconclusive results. And then in addition to the data that's collected at each of the study visits, we also are continually collecting uh, data from some of the Danish health registries. Um, so 
for example, we get information from the Danish vaccine registry so that we have um, complete ascertainment of all the uh, vaccines against uh, SARS-CoV-2 that have been given to our study population and the dates of these vaccines as well as the type. Uh, we also get information on all the PCR and antigen tests that are being conducted. And then for the positive test results, uh, the results of full genome sequencing if it was performed. And then um, additional registry data we get that is of interest, particular interest, is information on deaths and hospital admissions, including those that occur outside the period for reporting the serious adverse events. So you can see we have quite a wide range of data collected uh, for the study. And then um, in addition um, to the normal scheduled visits, because the booster uh, vaccines weren't originally planned as part of the study protocol, we weren't expecting them to introduce booster visits. We created an amendment um, to the study um, to, uh, so that we could collect both serum samples and safety measurements uh, following each of the booster doses. Um, so these were orig originally included just for the, visit, the third vaccine dose, so the booster visit. And there we introduced a study visit that was prior to receiving the booster vaccine, and then another one 28 days after uh, the booster, they'd received the booster vaccine. And so the participants weren't overwhelmed with like the number of study visits. Um, if a participant came for one of these two visits and it fell within the 30 days of one of the other study visits, then the regular course visit um, was skipped. And this was particularly the case um, for the visit four um, study visits where which was around the six month period. And that was when a lot of participants we saw were receiving their booster vaccine dose. So rather than get coming in for the visit four, they came in for the booster uh, scheduled visit instead. And here I've just got a graph that shows um, the total enrollment of the participants in the study. So in total, we managed to enroll 6,918 uh, participants. Uh, the first participant enrolled in the Pfizer group um, was enrolled in the middle of February of 2021. And um, there were um, enrollment in this group was paused um, in April after our initial target of 2,500 participants were enrolled. Um, but because these participants were all the ones that were enrolled early on and they were the high risk elderly individuals to try and include more younger individuals, we reopened enrollment in May and enrolled um, a further. Um, approximately 2,000 um, individuals into the Pfizer group. And this is the line you can see in blue here. And then for the Moderna vaccine arm, um, so it was, uh, we initially enrolled the first participant towards the end of uh, February, so slightly later than the Pfizer group. And um, enrollment in this um, group was initially a lot slower, and that was mainly due to the availability of the vaccines, uh, of the Moderna vaccine within Denmark. But as you can see um, on the yellow dotted line here, which shows the Pfizer, the Moderna group, sorry, um, the enrollment picked up between April and May, and we managed to enroll our target of uh, 2,000, uh, just over 2,500 participants into that group. Uh, we also initially started enrollment with participants in the AstraZeneca arm. Um, however, um, the Danish health authorities decided on the 11th of March uh, to pause the use of um, the AstraZeneca vaccine as part of the, the overall Danish vaccine program due to safety concerns. Um, so um, enrollment into that group was stopped um, at the same time as this was paused. However, we continued to follow up in the individuals who'd already received at least one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And you can see here from the two lines in grey and orange that they then went on to subsequently, most participants subsequently then received either a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, yeah, so that just gives you an overview of the enrollment. Um, and then just to give you a summary of the characteristics of the persons that we enrolled in the study group. So you can see that we achieved our aim of managing to enroll a high number of elderly or older individuals and um, individuals who were um, deemed to be at a high uh, risk of a serious course of disease should they become infected. So looking at the total, um, total dem patient demographics, you can see that um, more than 40% of individuals were aged over 65 um, were enrolled in the study. And also we had 23% of individuals who were um, in a vaccine priority group and assessed to be at an increased risk. Um, but what, one of the things, because of the way the vaccines were rolled out, as I mentioned uh, previously, 
is that the demographics between the different vaccine groups that we saw aren't very balanced. There's quite a lot of difference between the groups. And the, in the Pfizer group, um, you can see that almost 60% of the individuals are aged over 65, even despite us reopening enrollment to try and increase um, and get more younger individuals included. And this is also where we have the highest number of individuals at increased risk as well. Whereas in the Moderna group, we enrolled um, a much more balanced age demographic and uh, the majority of participants were from the general population. And also just to highlight that in the AstraZeneca group, um, the majority of individuals um, enrolled in this group were healthcare workers. And that was because this vaccine was originally rolled out to healthcare workers as part of the Danish vaccine program. And then this graph here just shows um, the proportion of individuals who received um, each number of vaccine doses over time. So you can see that um, by September of last year, almost 100% of the participants in our cohort um, had received at least two doses um, of the vaccine. And then the booster doses started to be rolled out towards the end of last year. Um, so that um, now more than 90% of individuals enrolled in our cohort have received three doses of um, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. And we've now had about approximately 400 individuals um, who were high risk and have been offered and taken up the opportunity to have a fourth dose of vaccine. And this occurred during the spring um, of this year. And we're now seeing a couple of individuals who have also um, been given a fifth dose of vaccine. And then just to show how we're going with the follow-up of our study visits, um, so we had a very high portion of individuals come in uh, for their second uh, visit, uh, over 94% of individuals. And the majority of participants missed uh, this study visit. It was uh, individuals in the AstraZeneca group where they were delayed in getting their second vaccine dose um, because they weren't getting AstraZeneca, they were getting different vaccines. Um, and then for the visits at three months and six months, um, over 85% of the individuals who were initially enrolled in the study have come in for both these study visits, um, which is really good. And now individuals have been under follow-up for between about 10 and 15 months. So you can see we're starting to get um, people in for their fifth study visit. And at the time I did these slides, which was um, in the middle of May, um, around 60% had been in for their fifth study visit. And we're hoping by the end of June, 90% um, of the individuals who are still under follow-up um, will have come in um, for their fifth study visit at one year. So it'd be really nice to have that data um, and have a good look at that once it's in. And then as with all studies, um, we have seen some less to follow up, um, although it's not been too high. And um, there was quite a few dropouts um, early on, um, particularly around the time that the causing of the AstraZeneca was announced. Then a few people dropped out of the study then. And then we've also seen some additional dropouts um, when participants um, in between their visit four and visit five. So now it's coming to being one year follow up. And we think this is partly due to um, COVID-19 being like less pronounced in the media and all the restrictions in Denmark were dropped early on in this year. So um, they're just less engaged and less interested in being part of the study. But we have implemented a number of different ways to try and keep the participants engaged and excited um, for the study. So we have um, a study website where participants can go on and they can find the information about the study. They can look uh, see how to book your study visits and um, they can see some of the results from the study and we also um, on here present um, some summary uh, reports based on the reports that we send to the Danish Medicines Agency so they can see all that information and we've also included um, sent out a couple of newsletters and um, just giving a summary of the overall um, results um, from the study and then an additional thing that we've been doing to try and help keep the participants engaged um, with the study and see the importance of it and the value of it is that we've actually sent out letters um, to the individuals, giving them their antibody results um, from the total spike um, IgG um, antibody measurements. Um, and then as part of the letter, we've given them a link to a secure website where they can go on and then um, enter their antibody data and compare it um, to the average for the studies overall. So they have something um, to kind of base it again. Basic. again. So here I've just um, posted on the slide um, a screenshot of what the web page looks like before the participant fills in any of the information. And the orange line here um, is the average of the participants, uh, of all the participants in Enforce um, at each of the study visits. So the first dot down by the zero here 
um, is the average uh, total spike antigen IgG antibody levels prior to individuals receiving the first vaccine dose. And then uh, we have, um, you can see a slight increase after they receive the second uh, vaccine dose, um, which goes up to visit three, which is where we saw the first peak in the antibody levels, and then it drops slightly down to visit four. And then here um, is also plotted um, the top one right at the top of the end is the um, average for individuals who came in for that 28 day visit after they received their uh, third dose, the booster dose from the vaccine. And then, on. Oh, oh, this slide's not coming up. Oh, here's perfect. Uh, so, and then on this slide, I've just put in like an example of what a participant might see um, if they um, entered their own uh, study data. So, the black dots at the bottom are the dates of their uh, vaccination. So they can put that information in as well. And then they can see how that relates to the antibody levels um, based on the time of when they received the vaccine. And here I've just created a fake participant who came in for all their study visits um, as planned. Um, and you can see that they have like a nice ice increase in antibody levels that decreases and then increases again after they have their booster dose. And it's just to note that when the participants go onto this web page, um, as soon as they leave the web page, their results aren't stored or anything. Um, it's just completely um, wiped. So um, we've had some feedback from the participants um, based on the letters they receive and also the being able to use this website. And it seems to be quite positive and they're quite happy. And they're actually asking us to send them their next lot of antibody results. Um, and I'll update the average graph once we have enough data from the one year study visits as well to include that. So then I thought I would just um, give you a brief summary of some of the main results from the uh, studies that we've uh, published so far. So I've picked two studies um, that both myself and Nina um, have been involved in. Um, so this first one um, is a study that um, was published in March last year in the um, Journal of Clinical, Mi Clinical Microbiology and Immunology. And I was looking at the characteristics um, associated with the vaccine response and um, durability. And um, what we found was that um, individuals um, had a initial, uh, the majority of individuals had initial um, increase in antibody levels um, following both the first and the second uh, vaccine. And you can see in the figure here, what I've shown is the, what sh what's shown here is the total spike uh, antibody by vaccine type in figure A, and then by um, the age group and the number of comorbidities, where comorbidities is um, assessed by the Charleston Comorbidity Index in figure B. And, um, and then um, for the ACE2 uh, competition assay in figure C and D. And as I said, although most people um, had a big increase after the first uh, and second vaccine doses, we did find that both comorbidity, male sex, and vaccine type were risk factors for a poor uh, vaccine response and also non -dur durability of response to the COVID 19 uh, vaccination. And we also found um, that functional activity of the vaccine induced antibodies, and that's what's shown by the ACE2 uh, measures, so figures C and D and DUNI, um, declined with increasing age and had waned to the pre second vaccine levels uh, for most individuals after their six months. Uh, after six months. And then the other study that I just wanted to briefly mention um, was published. Um, uh, <laughs> was pre, you know, published in preprint um, also in March and is currently under peer review. And this one um, is looking at breakthrough infections and whether there's association between the levels of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies and breakthrough infections. And what we found um, in this study is that we saw a strong association between the increasing levels of anti-spike antibodies and reduced risk of breakthrough infections when we looked at the Delta variant. And this in the figure is the middle um, numbers and uh, graphs that you see, where you see this nice trend that with increasing levels of antibodies, which are split by quintiles, we see this decreasing risk of breakthrough infections. However, when we looked at the Omicron, uh, variant specific variant, we didn't see the same trend. So that's um, at the bottom. However, it's worth noting that during the Omicron period, um, the total antibody levels in the study population overall were a lot higher 
as the Omicron outbreak in Denmark um, was around the end, uh, became dominant around the end of December, the beginning of January. And this also coincided when individuals had just received uh, the third booster vaccine dose. So when the overall antibody levels in the cohort were a lot higher. Um, and the nice thing we saw when we did look at the study as well was that, so there was 504 breakthrough infections um, overall observed during the study period. However, we only saw one case of severe uh, COVID-19 um, during the whole study period. And this was despite our cohort, uh, including a very high proportion of elderly and individuals at increased risk. So that was just a short summary of two of the main results that we had. And then in summary, um, just from the study overall, um, we, I think the good things about the study is that we managed to very quickly um, involve a large prospective cohort of individuals. And we managed to um, have a very broad distribution in age of these individuals and also include a high portion of individuals who were at an increased risk of um, a serious course of COVID-19, which was what we originally set out to do. Um, and also that we have pre-vaccination samples um, which I think is very interesting to have for the analysis. Um, however, the well, biggest limitation we've had is that, as I showed you with the patient demographics, the three vaccine groups have a, a very high degree of variation in the demographic vectors with the Pfizer group having a lot more elderly and at-risk people because these were the ones involved uh, first. And this makes comparisons across these different vaccine groups very challenging. And it, you might say that randomized design might have been a better option, Although at the time and, and the need for vaccines to be given to these participants uh, quickly, um, there wasn't feasible or ethical to be able to do it uh, that way. Um, and hopefully you'll agree, I think that the data generated from this cohort will be able to help guide the planning of future uh, COVID-19 vaccination programs over the following year. And then finally, I'd just like to thank all the members um, of the Enforced Consortium and especially all the participants that have included in the study and come in for their study visits and the staff involved in the study and the work supported by the Danish Ministry of Health. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. That was uh, very impressive. Um, I'll just take a look in the uh, Q&A. If you have any questions. OK, here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have one question here from Zoe Pana. Um, I'll just read it out loud to everyone. Uh, thank you for the excellent study and presentation. Enforce emphasizes the importance of real-world data and citizen engagement in clinical trials. May I ask about the engagement of the volunteers in the registry? Actually, how do you plan to proceed with the continuous testing, timing, uh, procedure, etc.? Uh, so I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but so the testing, we don't have uh, continuous testing within part of the study protocol. Uh, the testing is just done uh, based on the participants need to get to test, I guess, and the Danish health authority guidelines on when you should get tested. Um, so, and we can, uh, like overall in the population, so in Denmark testing has that we have very, very high testing rates. And I can see um, in the data that we have that over 90% of the cohort have been tested at some point um, during follow-up. Um, yeah, and we get registry data as it comes in. Yeah, I think you answered the, the question and so it is. Thanks. Is there any other questions? So this is the last chance to ask Joe. Okay, cool. Well then, thanks again, Joe. It was a real pleasure to hear. Um, and then I think we should move on to the next speaker. Um, and I'm really proud to present Dr. Elefteas Mulunakis. He's a professor of infectious diseases diseases at Brown University. He's the chief of infectious diseases at Rhode Island Hospital and the Miriam Hospital. 
and he's the director of Cobra Center for Antimicrobial Resistance and Therapeutic Discovery. And he's also a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Alford Medical School. And today, Dr. Milanakis, he will talk to us about the Vatico study. So please. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, you can hear me right. Uh, you see what happens when you get older. The older you get, people give you more titles and, <laughs> and less things to do. So what I'm going to tell you is, uh, is uh, about Vatico and we were involved in a number of clinical trials for COVID-19, uh, either from pharma or from uh, our NIH. And uh, what I'm going to present is uh, lessons that we learned because uh, uh, often we focus on, uh, on our successes, of, often we focus on uh, the big publications and, uh, and, and sometimes we forget that uh, in life, the lessons that we learn are usually more associated with things that went wrong. And I think that sometimes we, would, we need to share this information and, and give a heads up to, to younger people uh, scientists as they are putting together trials in this field. So, so Vatico is, uh, is a study that I'm going to introduce and I'm going to give you an honest appraisal of the study. The concept of the study is going to go first and the concept of the study is straightforward. Early on, we discovered that uh, vaccines are not a panacea to get it out, out of, uh, uh, of COVID-19 and the pandemic, we realized that uh, immunity wanes over time. This is one of the early uh, studies showing that. Uh, even with the dual vaccination, we found that, uh, and this is one of the first reports, that of course, severe disease, mortality goes down with vaccination. However, still you have breakthrough infections. And, and those are the studies, and this was uh, the study that I mentioned before that, you know, uh, uh, that helped us progressively realize the mistake that we made as a field to overpromise with the vaccines. And, and then it has taken us uh, since then to now start to rebrand the role of the vaccines into getting us out of the pandemic. Uh, in any case, uh, Obviously, this is the milieu of, of the studies when we were designing the, the, the study that I'm going to talk to you about. Another study that was really impactful during that early stage of, of designing the study, early stage just a year ago, but in any case, it's uh, uh, the study that showed from the UK that showed that about 24%, uh, 25% of people who are infected don't develop immunity from the infection. So the question that we wanted to answer here, uh, and uh, I'll go directly to the question is, does infection with, uh, uh, with or without vaccination against uh, SARS-CoV-2 lead to a lasting immunity? So, so at that point in time, we had, uh, we had uh, it was pre-Omicron, so the numbers of, of people who were exposed to COVID-19 were still, was still a percentage of the community. Uh, and, and then we had the vaccines coming together. And the question obviously is, okay, if somebody is infected already, so that person and gets admitted to the hostel, so that person get another series of vaccines? So that person, if, if that person did not have a vaccination beforehand, so that person get vaccination post-infection or the infection is good enough. So what do you do with the population that comes to you after severe infection vis-a-vis -vis the need for vaccines afterwards? And, and the, there are two parts of this question. The first part of this question is, do you give any more vaccines? And the second part is when? When is the optimal timing to give those vaccines? So this was a, the Vatico study was a two by two study that a, a, that focused on people who had severe COVID 
severe by definition in this case is people that needed to come to the hostel and get treated and get admitted and get treated for COVID-19. Okay, so so those are elderly, obese, immunosuppressed, uh, uh, people uh, who, who had a severe infection received some treatments. Does the treatment affect the ability and the optimal timing of vaccines? All those questions, very valid questions. So randomized those patients into two groups, either immediate vaccine, immediate meaning that uh, uh, really uh, 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 post uh, post recovery from the uh, from the infection, uh, immediate uh, uh, no booster, intermediate with booster, and deferred vaccination. So we try to answer all those questions and keep the number of patients in a reasonable uh, number. Very good study, not very bored, uh, very intense as far as visits uh, with patients. As you see here, uh, 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 it was a 48 week follow up, still with 48 weeks, unlikely, unlikely with the numbers that we were expecting, unlikely to, to get clinical data. So you had to go through markers, markers of ability to mount a, 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 a response a, to, the, to the infection, usually level of antibodies. And, and those are the visits and, and the, you know, the, and you can see when blood work was, uh, was going to be obtained. This study, I, I told you the inclusion and inclusion criteria, I'm not going to go into detail, but that is the basic concept uh, that, uh, that I try to describe to you. So, as I said before, this is going to be an appraisal of the difficulties. The study is still ongoing. We have uh, a few dozen patients uh, that, that we closed the study because of poor enrollment uh, uh, and, and we are following those patients and we are doing the visits as we were uh, expected to do. But, but, but again, the challenge number one, site participation. Trying to have, so you, we, this a, a surprise to us was that the groups that see patients in the hostel, sometimes they don't have the facilities to follow them up as outpatients for vaccine trials. So patients who are severe COVID-19 come to the hostel, you have a team there of investigators and, uh, and maybe some uh, uh, research assistants who are following them there. Uh, and then when they get discharged, they have to come back. We have to have a, an area for them to come back. You have to have a phlebotomist to draw the blood. You have to have a, an isolated area for the research personnel. This is not available to every, every place. Also, this is happening during the pandemic. So from 73 sites that, that really showed interest and they, at the time of the peak, they had almost uh, 1,200 potential eligible participants, three, 30 open and only 19 enrolled the participants. This is very challenging, the sites during the pandemic, having the same people, seeing the patients from a clinical perspective, following them up, doing the outpatient was, it was extremely difficult. This is the numbers uh, in more detail. I hope that the slides will be made available to you uh, to, to look at the numbers, but that this is the trend. So site participation was a challenge. The changes of the guidelines, you heard before about the changes about the AstraZeneca, uh, and and uh, you know the 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 authorities that uh, in in Denmark that uh, you know uh, changed their uh, uh, availability of the AstraZeneca vaccine. In our case, the changes of of the guidelines was was remarkable. Uh, first of all, when we were designing the study, the vaccines were uh, really becoming available. When we were ready to enroll patients. We had patients, uh, the, the guidelines asked for boosters. Even the definition of who is fully vaccinated from the CDC changed from two doses or a day and day one dose to, to having a, 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 third, a, a, do, a, a third dose. And even for immunosuppressed patients, uh, the third dose now is part of the initial vaccination protocol. And then, and then there was this uh, nightmare guideline about uh, people who received monoclonal antibodies, they have to wait for 90 days uh, about uh, getting any vaccines. Who came out of with this? 
I have no idea, no data, increased confusion. The problem with the vaccines is that the more the people are confused, the more they stay away from the vaccine. So, so if you have, if 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 people outside of medicine and 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 uh, and, and uh, uh, epidemiology and public health, uh, the lay uh, people, even if they are very interested in the vaccines, when they see confusion, they are turned off about vaccination. So it's easy to say, oh, blame the the political powers, blame the populists uh, about the vaccines. But also we have, sometimes we have to think about how to make it clear, both the known and the unknown of vaccinations. In our case, the guidelines changed, it was a whole night. The, the participation of companies was another challenge. We, we had the uh, IND application, it took forever. I, for, for the life of me, I cannot understand why people who, who make decisions about policies don't realize that the pandemic the, the requires a different pace, a different pace than routine work. Three years now into the pandemic, still, still we haven't been able to get bureaucracy move close to the way that the virus is moving. Companies, as soon as they get the EUA, they don't really care that much. That's my impression. That's that's uh, uh, an N of one, but they lose the incentive to participate in clinical trials. Why should a company risk a negative result or go through the pains of a, of a, of a investigator initiated trial uh, when they already have the EUA? What is, what is going to be the benefit? It's not clear to them. So, so you see here that the first protocol was February of 2021. Randomization uh, started months after that, uh, going through the IRBs, going through the FDA, going to the uh, different uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. You see that uh, first non-US and uh, first site opening the US in August. This is a different virus, a different pandemic by then. And then vaccine availability uh, internationally. Trying of obviously, obviously vaccination trials and vaccine evaluation trials, they have to be international, both because of the dynamic of the pandemic, but also because of the high numbers that you need and the and the overall participation that you need and the and the inclusiveness that you need to foster. However, it's very difficult to 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 align availability of this resource. And this problem will come up again because there are Omicron vaccines now coming up. So what I'm, I'm saying is, is not a episodic event. I am afraid that this is a, a, a part of, of a difficulty within the system that needs to be addressed. Um, and then, the, the, the companies, as I said before, they didn't really have any motivation to even provide single dose vaccines. You had to have 10, uh, 10 doses in the vial and then you have to, to, uh, to make sure that you don't throw anything away and, and to coordinate vaccination and, and, uh, and the initial uh, batch that we were giving had only six months of, uh, of left uh, uh, expiry date. A number of, of technical difficulties that uh, were based on trying to align international sites, trying to align availability, and trying to motivate pharmaceutical companies. And you see here the poor uh, 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 enrollment from international sites, although some of them were able to, uh, they were, the PIs were extremely motivated, extremely motivated. So, so uh, from the 441 uh, eligible patients, only 66 were enrolled and they are now under evaluation by Vatican. Another part is it's difficult for patients, even though I, I try to explain to you that this is not a very complicated trial. Uh, still patients had enough. They had 
the COVID, the infection, at least one. They had participation in TICO trial, a, an investigational trial with the follow-ups, and then even a light, quote unquote, light trial with, with just a few follow-ups and with a vaccine availability was just too much for them. It was just, just too much. A, another part, and I think I have it in the next, uh, yes. And then, and then if you have two trials, if you have two trials, back to back, then you're starting to, inc to, to introduce bias. You start to introduce bias because as I told you, different sites, different vaccine availability, international sites, et cetera, but you introduce bias because you start to see the healthier, the healthier subgroup to be a little more keen to get to a second trial. Not only patients, don't want to get to the trial, to a second trial, but also you see, you start to see that patients who have recovered the most, uh, uh, they are more key, more likely to understand, participate in the trial. If the person is in nursing home, if the person is, is still on oxygen, if the person is, is still uh, extremely unwell, that person is less likely to, to get enrolled in a second trial. Then uh, vaccination beliefs. Oh, here we go. It's, uh, we, we did, uh, I, I'll go to this slide because it also we asked people, we asked 68 people why they refused to participate. And they said too tired to do a second protocol. And the others, some of them did not want to randomize to a deferred group. And that was the second reason. And the third reason was they did not want to get to be vaccinated already. So you see that you have you have human beings who some of them are very keen to get the vaccine as soon as possible, and others don't want even to hear about the vaccine. So those are real challenges that you need to address, and you need to be able to stay on the phone or you know face to face with with a person and go through their biases, their misinformation, their misunderstanding of, of guidelines, and try to go one by one by one, and hopefully they're going to get them enrolled. So this is this is clinical trial one oh one. So lessons that we learn. So you know. I, I, that's as a parent. That's what I try to do with my daughters when when they have a, a challenge. I try to to pivot to okay, what can we learn from this? Not an easy pivot, but but that's that's the goal always in life. So understanding the reinfections and the immunologic escape remains a very important problem. So when you start a trial, you are thinking that okay, the delay might make this trial less attractive to a big journal, less attractive to, uh, less interesting to, to readers, less interesting to my field. Here we saw an increase in the interest. You see here how Omicron is so different from what we had before. You see here how the spike is so different from what we, we knew all those mutations. And we see here that the natural immunity from Omicron is weak and limited. And even with Omicron, uh, we see that uh, 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 this nature paper described the uh, cross-variant immunologic event. So you see that uh, immunologic events, uh, uh, sera from people who were infected with alpha, beta, delta, or Omicron, they had very limited cross-activity uh, cross cross uh, with others. And, and, and now this report from uh, the Baru lab and others also, they, they describe how the spike difference between all the Omicron subvariants and how even the subvariants of Omicron, uh, they, you see that if uh, they, they have different uh, uh, sera from, from infected patients, have different and less uh, in decreasing ability to inhibit uh, the the subvariants as we, as we go from BA one to to two plus now to four and five, and 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 you see what is happening in Portugal uh, with five that is now eighty percent of the infections there. The new infections are are five. Uh, it's increasing in the U.S. 
uh, the vaccines uh, are all, you know, at least the Moderna vaccine that they have uh, announced the results is based on BA1, the dual with the influenza. So, so the, the question remains pertinent. However, during the pandemic, the post-marketing studies, the vaccine availability, the changing guidelines, the evolving immune response to the vaccine and our understanding of that immune response, the different treatment protocols, monoclonals, uh, remdesivir, uh, uh, the varying vaccine acceptance up and down different uh, patient groups uh, and the emergence of new variants make it very difficult to practically very difficult to do those studies. And then policy changes, uh, trials after the EUA uh, was granted and post EUA uh, uh, regulatory agents and participation by pharmaceutical companies it makes it very, very difficult to perform the study. So engaging pharmaceutical companies and maintaining their interest, their interest is, is, is difficult. So what we need is to invest in a complex infrastructure that already exists, in my opinion, an international uh, group of studies that have already addressed some of those problems. They have pre-existing infrastructure and they have an avenue that can then come to life when the question arises. And then policies, uh, uh, we need a, a much broader population would provide information about the effect and we need to, to think bigger. This, this difficulty shouldn't stop us from thinking of that this question is very important to address. But we have to start thinking about larger trials international trials that will have a clinical, clinical endpoint with enough follow-up. So, so Heraclitus was a stoic, was a very influential uh, pre-Socratic philosopher who reminded us, and as I said before, since I'm Greek, I had to put an old guy saying something as part of the presentation. So the only thing that is constant in life is change. And in the time of the pandemic, I think that Heraclitus would be very happy, not with the pandemic, but very happy and very stoic with his, uh, his uh, learnings. So the significant questions remain. Studies uh, meant to answer those questions have a series of regulatory and practical challenges that, that not only are important for the field to overcome, but it's also for important for young scientists to know about before they get engaged in those trials. Because, okay, this is important for, 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 for the humanity to, to answer those questions, but also for, for young colleagues, this is their life, this is their PhD, this is their uh, opportunity to, to make a mark in, in science. So they need to, to be cognizant of those difficulties. Supervising uh, agents have to come together, a legal and ethical framework has to come together and collaborators across different uh, countries have to come together and, and find a way that the, those problems are addressed and as much as possible prepared in advance. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And I will just look in the, sorry. <laughs> Are there any questions? Well, I have one um, myself, if that's okay. Um, so um, I agree with, uh, you, you pointed out some very important issues that we've seen these past years. Uh, and you mentioned the 90 days that we had to wait for patients to, to be vaccinated after receiving monoclonals. And still now in Denmark, it's, it's uh, recommended that you wait at least four weeks after having had COVID before you receive a vaccination. Do you have any? And I'm, I don't think there's any data behind that, actually. But do you have the same in the US? Or do you know what, what the practice is? Uh, no, we advise vaccination right after the infection. We don't know if this is correct. Uh, and, but I can tell you that uh, I have uh, patients uh, who have an infection and then two weeks later, three weeks later, come with a second infection because of the parallel uh, different BA subvariants that, uh, that, uh, that are uh, in our community. So, so certainly, uh, I, I, we, we, I would 
think that putting every patient, public health vaccination policies have to be simple in order to be followed. But, but that simplicity takes away from the detail that is needed in order for people to understand where we are, understand the knowledge and understand the subpopulation. So if you have an immunosuppressed patient who comes in with severe COVID-19, you cannot apply the same rule as a 30 year old who came and by the way, had COVID-19 also. Thank you. That was very nice. I, I don't know, are there any other um, questions from the audience? I'm just looking at the chat. I don't see any yet. I hope I that I didn't, uh, people don't change their CV <laughs> now to go to a different field. <laughs> <laughs> don't get discouraged. <laughs> Yeah, I am a bit worried about the vaccine availability for, for studies now, for investigator-driven studies. Do you think we will succeed to, to, be a way to get the vaccines uh, for the studies that we want to do? I, I think that it's going to be difficult for, for pharma to, to, to give the vaccine depends on the trials. They want to have control of their vaccine. And then once they get the EUA, they, they are not interested. Because if you go and you take a, a vaccine that is made for BA1, uh, and then you try to study it today, the results that you're going to get today, uh, with four and five being in my community about 25, and probably next week will be 40%, uh, it's going to be much different. So why risk it? Uh, I, I, I think that there are other companies who will come into play and and it's just uh, to me, I, I think that the regulatory agencies have to intervene to make sure that those vaccines are available to investigators for follow-up studies. That's me. Great. Thank you. And I can see that we have a lot of the, the audience thanking you for the very clear presentation. So I'd just like to mention that. And then thanks a lot um, to you and to Joe and to the audience, uh, everyone joining today. Uh, this has been a real pleasure. Um, yeah, so thank you. I think we're finalizing here. I can see that Janina just, uh, or Fiona, just shared the, the next webinar in the chat so you can see uh, the date is 27th of June. Um, so look at the link, follow the link there, there to register. Yeah, thank you.